to host a forum uh, for objective scientific presentations about human-bear interactions and the procedures to learn more about the procedures for managing the complaints and nuisance bear problems. We wanted to provide an opportunity for the public um, to discuss and communicate um, in order so that we can foster constructive and respectful communication. So we are all um, humans together and we are all going to be civil and respectful and I know that these are this is an emotional topic for some people and we are not going to go there we're talking about the science we're talking about the policy and we're talking about solutions we want to be solution oriented today um, the structure of the meeting we are going to have um, several different um, uh, presenters and they have a limited time for each of their presentations and mine is supposed to be five minutes or less, so we'll see how I do. <laughs> and then, um, and some presentations are PowerPoint, some are not. Not everyone was required to bring a PowerPoint. Um, we are going to try to stay on agenda. We have about an hour, uh, and a little less than an hour and a half of actual presentations, and then we have a half hour for questions and answers. Um, Andy Wyman is going to be our moderator, and we are going to try to keep, he can tell us the rules of those, but we're going to try to keep it to like a one minute question with a three minute response maximum so that we can get the most questions and answers. And Andy is a 10 year resident of Incline Village. Uh, he's a medical doctor who studied at Stanford. He hosts the Sierra Nevada College Fireside Chat, so he's used to hosting these community events and he's active in the community. So, and he also has mentioned that he is very neutral in this topic, and so I think he will be a good facilitator for us. Um, so, starting with the first presentation is Commissioner David McMinch from the NDOC Mission, and I'm not sure if I'm saying all that correctly, so we'll just go ahead and invite David up. So let's welcome him. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dave McNinch, and I am a member of the State Wildlife Commission. Uh, I don't have a formal presentation. Um, I don't want to. Uh, if you've been to any of our meetings, you can know that they, they can go on for days and days and days and days and days. Uh, so I don't have a formal presentation. But what I would like to do in the couple minutes that I have here is to kind of explain to you how um, how our wildlife commission is set up in the state of Nevada. Um, currently, uh, you have a Department of Wildlife, Nevada Department of Wildlife. And the Wildlife Commission is a nine-member board representing a variety of interests from around the state of Nevada. And uh, the, the Commission's primary responsibility is to establish broad policy for the, the operations of the Department of Wildlife. And that includes uh, everything from boating to fisheries to, uh, to wildlife management having to do with the hunting and seasons, uh, having to do with wildlife diversity, habitat. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very busy agency. Um, I've kind of lost track of how many folks they have there, but uh, 200 plus or minus, um, a variety of offices. And uh, the nine-member commission, uh, we meet um, we meet seven to nine times a year. And uh, um, currently, I'm serving as a, a conservation representative on the commission. Like I said, there's a number of uh, there's a number of uh, um, uh, representations in a, from a variety of places. So. Um, any of you that have read the paper or have been in uh, keeping track of the bear issue you know that we've had some uh, pretty pretty lengthy meetings and some pretty uh, difficult discussions, uh, some pretty controversial decisions, and, and uh, um, we're here primarily tonight, I am. Uh, there are a couple of other committee members. Uh, as part of that commission, uh, the committees are formed um, so that we don't conduct all of our business in front of the commission. We, we usually go two days as it is. Uh, there's a number of things, and rather than take up any one particular day with a, a full slate of, uh, of just bear issues or, or fishing issues or trapping issues, we have a variety of committees. And uh, uh, there are three committees uh, members from the five-member committee that have been appointed by the chairman of the Wildlife Commission uh, that are here tonight. I haven't seen, uh, I know one will not be here, and I haven't seen the other. Um, so our interest is to get some input, uh, hear from the folks up here, get a feel for uh, make a presence. We want to make a presence up here. The uh, Department of Wildlife makes a presence all the time. Uh, they're up here managing uh, bears. Um, and uh, But the Wildlife Commission and the committee wanted to make uh, some level of, of uh, uh, presence and wanted to be up here and, and uh, get, hear, hear from people. We want to hear what's going on uh, um, and, and start, start forming some opinions about uh, things that we need to, that we're going to be looking at in the future here. So. 
Um, with that, um, I'm sure there'll be some questions and answers later later on. But uh, with that, we're glad to be here, and thank you. All right. I'm going to cover at this time just a little bit of bear basics. Many people in the audience are probably very familiar with bears, but we wanted to make sure that everybody was at least on the same page on some of the, some of the items. Um, here in Nevada and in California, we're dealing with Ursus Americanus. It's your basic American black bear. Um, we do not have grizzly bears here, which are a brown bear species. Um, the bears in Nevada and California move around. They don't stay on one side uh, of a state line or the other. Um, even though they're black bears, you're probably going to see mainly a brown bear. Most of them have some shade of brown. They come in every range of color from uh, brown to black to blonde. Um, the bear population estimate in Nevada is provided by Endow and on their website. In the past, they had listed two to 300 bears in 2008. And the most recent update that's presented on their website is three to 400 bears. In California, as you can see from the numbers, there are a lot more bears running around in the state of California. What are these bears? Um, the black bear, the males are bigger than the females. Um, the, some of the statistics that are up here right now are describing the behavior of a wildland bear. I'm going to get a little bit into what's the difference between a bear that's a real wildland bear and a bear that has become more of an urban bear and uh, acclimated to human presence and human um, environment. So they live a pretty long time. They like to live in the mountains. They have been seen crossing the desert and in the desert, but they really do like our, our scrubland, our foothills, and our mountain environment. Um, if they're a wild bear, they should be cruising around at night rather than during the day. The bears are usually solitary, except when there's a mother and a cub. And a, a cub can stay with a mother through the, about a year and a half to two years as a yearling. Um, they're very good climbers. They may look slow when they're walking around, but they can run very fast. If they're a wild bear and their food source disappears in the winter, as it should, when all the plants and all the vegetation is gone, um, they should sleep for, they don't actually fully hibernate, but they should be dormant for a, quite a bit of period of time. If a bear is uh, able to get food in the winter, however, it will be up and it will be out. As many of you know, we have a lot of bear activity here in incline even in the winter. That's due to food availability and when we have a break in the storms, milder weather conditions. They've got bad eyesight, but they hear well and they smell even better. Not them themselves, what they smell, they can smell. Very long period of uh, long way, and that's one of their main ways of finding food. They don't smell good. Um, a bear in the wild should be eating an omnivorous diet. It should be eating bugs, it should be eating grass. If there's fish, they're going to eat fish. If they find something laying there dead already, they're probably going to eat that. Um, they need to gain a tremendous amount of calories in the fall to be ready for winter. So that's why we see so much more activity with the bears coming into town and being very active in the fall. They've got to put up on the calories. They've got to almost double their weight to get through the winter if they're going to stay dormant through that winter time. That's why garbage, bird seed, pet food are really attractive. High calorie food source. Bird seed has thousands of calories per pound in it. So those of you that have bird feeders, you shouldn't have them up in the summer. You shouldn't probably even have them up here at all in the winter. Um, but it's a hard thing to get people to take their bird feeders down. But you're not doing the bears any favor feeding them bird seed. If they're a wild bear, they should grow up for a while, and then at five or six years old, they'll start playing around boy girls and bear, girl bears and making baby bears. They give uh, birth to one or two cubs every other year. A lot of those young bears die just because it's hard to be a bear. Um, this is again courtesy of Endow. This is a map of uh, where bears had historical range and have uh, current range. Um, as you can see, most of the bears uh, live very close to Lake Tahoe, although there are bears in other areas of the state. There's not much uh, on the east, but that was historical range and there have been sightings in the past. California, we're talking about a lot more bears over a lot more area. Um, basically, the Central Valley is one of the areas where you won't really have black bears. That was traditional grizzly bear habitat, actually, in the past. Um, but the black bears are all the way down to San Diego through the mountains, all the way through the Sierras, and in the coastal ranges as well. Okay, so those of you who have been in Incline for a while, there have always been bears here, but it sure seems like over the last seven to ten years, we have seen a lot more bears. Some of that is attributed to uh, movement. 
It's not necessarily that there are more bears around, but the bears have moved and concentrated in basically the Lake Tahoe area. Um, a lot of that was response to uh, environmental conditions that had occurred over this period of time. We've had some really bad droughts off and on over the last 10 years. We've had more development in the foothills. Um, we've had loss of natural forage, especially related to uh, those droughts and removal of traditional bear habitat. Um, this map is again from Endow, and uh, the blue rings represent where bears are in the backcountry and where they spend most of their time. Um, it's almost like we have two kinds of bears now. We have wild bears and we have urban bears. And as you can see, the red label for the urban bears, it's concentrated all up and down the east shore and then down like the uh, Minden Garnerville area a little south of us. There, the urban bears are responding to food that we are giving them in our communities. This is a great graphic that High Country News featured a couple of years ago. Um, they basically compare some of the uh, characteristics of a wild bear versus an urban bear. The wild bears are skinnier. They take longer to sexually mature. They live longer. They cover way more territory. They go uh, dormant in the winter for a much more period of time. And they eat a greater variety of food, of natural food, um, whereas the wild bear is definitely, excuse me, the urban bears, which become conditioned to human food, live shorter periods of time. They don't really move around nearly as much. Why would you go somewhere else if you're getting a good dinner all the time? Um, and um, they definitely have very different habits. A question that's often raised is why don't you just keep relocating the bears? The Department of Wildlife in Nevada and the California Department of Fish and Game will relocate bears, and Carl Ackie has presented some information in the back, in the back on the number of bears he's handled. They will um, handle bears for research needs um, and to deal uh, with a nuisance bear in certain situations. But the research that's presented nationally and internationally is relocation is very challenging and necess doesn't necessarily work. I lived in Sequoia National Park for a season, and they re 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 relocated a mother bear 500 miles over Mount Whitney. And the bear came back in a month to Sequoia National Park. So the bears want to come back. They want to come back, and they sometimes make it back, and a lot of times they get killed on the way coming back. Um, some of the other reasons why relocation is not the one and all answer for uh, bear management is once a bear does become used to kind of being around people and getting food, um, it's, it's kind of hard to just tell that bear, go back to being a wild bear, don't do that anymore. Um, conditioning is conditioning. So if a bear doesn't learn these habits in the beginning, the bear has a much better chance of surviving and not becoming um, a statistic. So um, relocation sounds great to the public and to everybody, and we'd all like to just keep moving the bears around, but they come back, they get in trouble other places, it's very expensive, and you haven't solved the problem in the first place. You've got to get rid of attractants if you don't want bears in the community. Um, if you have trash that's out and you move a bear, another bear is going to move in. They just, they take each other's place in the environment. If there's a bear that dies or a bear that's moved, another bear moves in. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about in the next, I only have two more slides right now, and then you get to see me again a little later. But one of the things I'd like to bring to the audience here is we're not alone in trying to deal with a non-lethal, um, better way to do bear management. There are many communities nationally and internationally that deal with bears. Some of them deal with grizzly bears. I'm pretty glad we don't have to deal with grizzly bears because that's a whole nother level of, uh, it's a much different creature than an American black bear. Um, some examples of communities that are um, follow bear smart principles are Whistler, British Columbia. They're the leaders. They have a tremendous website called bearsmart.com. They present um, a ton of information on how people can live with bears, how uh, communities can deal with living with bears. Some other excellent models, Mammoth Lakes, California, just to the south of us, Durango, Colorado. Colorado is really taking a strong lead on this. Several communities in Colorado have excellent bear awareness programs. Everybody still has problems in their programs. There's somebody's doing 
trash management better. Somebody's doing um, education better. Somebody's got a bear, somebody on staff who can run bears around while they're in town. But these communities all have different models, and they all have different uh, levels of success, but they're mainly seen as leaders in uh, kind of a progressive bear management um, options. You don't, bear smart doesn't just happen. Everybody has to work pretty hard at this, including uh, planning agencies, um, over, regulatory agencies with oversight, and community members. So this bear smart thing has six main points that you try to address. And some of the ones we've addressed pretty well here in our community, and some of them, um, these are sparking ideas for us on things we can do so that we're doing bear management better. But these are kind of the universal principles coming from that bear smart model. First, prepare a hazard map, an assessment map of your community and the area. So we all kind of have a pretty good idea here of where the bears run around. They run up and down 28. They're hiding behind the fetus. Um, we don't have this formalized. This may, be, this may be a very easy thing for us to work on. Creating priority zones. Where, where should bears not be tolerated at all? The commercial corridor is a really bad place for the bear. Now, a bear up in my neighborhood on Upper Tyner, well, maybe that bear just came in from the woods and it's got a whole different level of hazard being up there than down below. So this is one of the, the, the number one is one of the key items we don't have done in our community and we're gonna be pretty much working on that. Number two and three, uh, number two, the Nevada Department of Wildlife released a bear management plan this spring. Uh, it's available on their website. Um, the bear committee and some other members of the community, that plan was laid out. There's going to be, I hope, input on that plan. Uh, but it is formalized and it's available for your view. There's a copy outside um, on the table. Um, number three requires all, number one and number two be done. So I'm going to skip number three because we're not there yet. Number four, bear awareness education. One of the most important things you guys can do is talk to everybody else you know about bears. Um, because one of the best ways in this community to reach our neighbors is for a neighbor to talk to them. If the Waste Not provides a lot of education in the community, the Department of Wildlife has a, a website and some information and they do their bear awareness um, for, out of the state, out of Endow. Um, but here in Incline Village, uh, Waste Not is one of your community resources, and I have brand new bear awareness brochures out there. I have them in Spanish. We have a trash hotline card. We have a variety of things we're working on so that the education can go out. So people understand that garbage is the number one attractant, that food is the number one reason why the bears are here, um, and how to, how do you deal with the garbage? Well, we can help you with the education on that and finding out how to store your trash. Um, and we provide some services on that too. Number five and number six are the final points. Number five is another thing that it gets worked pretty hard on. We're going to continue to work on it. There's always ways to improve what we do. And that's to develop a bear-proof municipal solid waste system. We've got bear-proof dumpsters. They're pretty much also human-proof on some levels. A lot, of the problems, a lot of the problems we see in the community are when somebody doesn't take the time to lock the dumpster, or their dumpster, the latch isn't working right, and they didn't bother to call it in to get it repaired. So we feel we've done a pretty good job on number four and number five. Of course, we're going to keep working on those. Um, but those are two key items. You're going to see a presentation a little later from our compliance um, department, and you're going to see how many complaints we had on trash a few years ago and how this system of putting in bear cans, having bear carts, having log dumpsters, having a trash hotline has been knocking that number down, which is what we want. Um, number six requires some more interagency participation. There's no anti-feeding ordinance in the state of Nevada. And I know the Department of Wildlife has been asking for years for support on getting either countywide or statewide anti-feeding ordinances. Um, and if they can't do anything about somebody feeding the bear. We can go talk to somebody, but we have no enforcement over somebody feeding the bear. So number six is a whole giant loophole of its own that's a county and statewide problem for, for Nevadans. Um, but the Department of Wildlife has been working on that, and they, uh, I believe there's another request in the legislature coming up to try to address that. 
Um, and then the last line goes with that. Just so you know, Bear Smart can only be certified in Canada, but the principles are universal. So um, we, we, we won't officially get Bear Smart certified, but we're going to hopefully work off these principles um, and keep to improve. So with that said, um, I'm done for the Okay, hi everybody. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, normally when we do any kind of a presentation on bears all the years that I've been doing this, we fill the room up with bear people. And it's like talking to the choir. Um, <laughs> they already know all about bears. So I'm hoping that there are some people here tonight that maybe we can uh, bring on board that maybe don't know and can ask some good questions and we can all put our heads together at the at the end of the evening when we do the panel discussion and uh, not just the bear lovers but maybe those that aren't, aren't quite so appreciative of these animals. It takes all of us. So let's get started on uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, we, we founded the Bear League 15 years ago when this mother bear was killed and uh, that cub was killed for going into a trap that was set for a different bear. Uh, that doesn't happen in Nevada. Nevada has a different depredation type of policy than we do in California. So um, it orphaned this cub and we rescued him and it was a big media sensation and the Bear League found it. So like I always say, it, it, I didn't found the Bear League, she did. And uh, her name is Natalie and she's, she's with me in spirit tonight with all of us. Um, we um, have only black bears in California, as Madonna said. They are extremely um, highly misunderstood. Uh, I think due in no small part to the fact that they are confused all the time with the grizzly bear. Uh, they're uh, a completely different animal. They're much less aggressive. They're not uh, nearly as protective of their cubs as the grizzly bear. They're not um, angry. They're just in, in no way are they as dangerous as a grizzly bear. If you hear bears playing patty cake in the woods anywhere in Tahoe, keep in mind it will not be a grizzly bear. When people came out here, about white people came out, oh, about 150, almost 200 years ago now, toting their guns, uh, the first thing they did was promptly start shooting anything that they didn't understand or that they were afraid of. We almost annihilated all the Native American people and we did annihilate the grizzly bear. By 1922, the last one was killed. So all we have left is the docile, little, timid black bear. Uh, he is uh, probably survived all the onslaught of the, the westward movement, due because he is very, um, he is timid, and he's shy, and retreats into the woods, climbs a tree, and uh, waits for the danger to go away. and. Um, that's one of the reasons I think that they, they made it through all of the, the butchery that happened. Also, I, I really firmly believe it's uh, due to their extreme intelligence. These animals are uh, amazing uh, in, in watching them for all the years I've had. I've been able to work with them. I've noticed one really important thing. They are evolving around our presence much quicker and much smarter than we ever can hope to around theirs. We are left behind in the dust when it comes to that. <laughs> they're so much further past us. Uh, they're, they're absolutely amazing. One of the things I've noticed that they've done just, just in the last 15 years since I've been doing this, starting out, they didn't know how to open a jar of peanut butter. They would mangle it and uh, destroy it, chew it and rip it, you know, rip, rip the bottle up and jelly. Now, after several nights, I'm sure, of peeking into our kitchen windows and watching how we take the jar in one hand and, and uh, take our other hand and twist the lid, they do the same thing. They now can open jelly jars and peanut butter jars that have never been opened. One bear uh, got into a lady's pantry on the uh, West Shore. She had just set up 36 jars of apricot jam. I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> we call it apricot, and you call it apricot. Um, she, and uh, she was not happy, but he did not break a single jar. They were all laying there in a pile with the lids and the jars all clean and looked as if to say, I'll be back tomorrow night. And they still can't <laughs> <close> again. <laughs> yeah. Went like that. So she did not appreciate that and called and I, I went, I knew he'd be back. 
He was fully expecting, you know, a reward again. And uh, along about two o'clock, and I was hiding behind a tree. I had my slingshot. I was fully armed. And he came back and walked up to the pantry. And instead of getting a, a food reward this time, he got blasted in the rear end with a small rock, and he took off, and he has never been seen again. So uh, it, it works, and um, this is, you know, this is one of the ways that they're evolving. They also have learned very well, as many of you know, how to go around, uh, especially in the evenings, and look for car doors that are not locked, even if there isn't any food in it. There might be. And if the door is locked, is unlocked, you know, they're going to give it a try. The problem is uh, they get in and uh, sometimes the door will slam shut on them. And then you've got a trapped bear and he's uh, going to do anything to try and get out. So these are some of the tips that we recommend. We have people with convertibles that use just fine saw and they can keep them out. So they've learned that. But the worst thing. And the worst problem that we're all experiencing is uh, the fact that they have learned now how to go around to houses and check the doors and windows to see if they are locked. And if they're not locked, they know how to slide them open or take their, their paw, which is actually a hand, and open that doorknob just like a human would. Now, a few years ago, they couldn't do that. But now, they can go from house to house and I think they, they met in the woods one night and they decided, let's, let's try this. This just might pay off. And so they have been doing it. And they'll go in if there's a bowl of fruit on the counter or a plant or whatever. Okay, it's theirs. If they can smell it and they can get at it, it's theirs. That's the rule. So they're going in and they're finding food. We get probably 25 calls a day on our hotline, which we answer 24-7. Um, on bears that entered into homes with open doors or windows. Um, we had one mama bear that did this uh, in uh, Sunnyside not too long ago. She went in through an open window during the night. The man was down the hall uh, in the bed and he heard noises and he thought it was his unruly neighbor raiding his refrigerator. So he got up and he peeked out the door and instead of seeing the neighbor, he sees a great big bear sitting in front of his refrigerator the light from the refrigerator shining upon her as she reached in and picked through the things that she wanted and threw aside the things she didn't want. And the cubs, who uh, probably weren't in the partying mood yet, were laying over on the couch, sound asleep. Well, he cowered back in the house and, and, and or into his bedroom and called us. And we went racing down there and um, saw you know what was going on and chased her out. and. Uh, after we left, we realized, or after she left, we saw that she'd been sitting right by the, uh, the dining room table where his computer, his laptop was, and there were paw prints on the screen and on the keyboard. And, and uh, to, this, to this day, we're not sure whether she was doing any online dating or <laughs> possibly checking her, her investments. But uh, she did run off another, another bear. This guy um, went into an open window at a person's house on the North Shore, not too far from here. And the neighbor called us, just laughing uproariously, uproariously and said, you should have seen this. He just crawled right into that window. It was left open. And about three seconds later, that bear flew out of there. The house cat was chasing him. <laughs> chased him up the tree. And the bear sat up there for hours whining because the cat had chased him away. So they're, they're easy to scare off, but they do make a mess. And uh, usually, if you've had a bear in your house once, it's enough not to want to have it happen again. I've had him in my house. I know a lot of people have. I left a window open one time and went to a party and came back and there's mom and a cub in there. So generally they don't clean up. They're not there to rob you. They're not there to steal your jewels and your electronics, but, but they do not really clean up after themselves. However, we did have a case where a bear went into a woman's house and she was standing right there in the kitchen. He opened up the door, he came in and went right to the refrigerator like he'd been there before <laughs> and grabbed a quart of ice cream and carried it into the dining room, sat down on the Persian rug and ate the ice cream. Well, as he was eating it, she collected her wits and went, oh, I have to call somebody. So she called us and we were just like two minutes away. We got there real quick, chased him out. And she, out of her mouth was, the first word was, oh, I, just, I just don't even believe it. He didn't even make near the mess my grandchildren do. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, but generally they, they do. So, okay, now what's the point of this? And I've got stories I could tell you all night long of bears in houses, sometimes with people in them, usually with not, but quite often there are people in there. So why aren't there a lot of dead people in the wake of all these bears? I mean, a great, big, huge animal that's supposedly so dangerous and so aggressive with huge claws and teeth in a house with a person. Why aren't all these people dead? Nobody's ever been killed in either California or Nevada, or for, um, for that matter, Oregon either, by any of these bears. Hundreds and hundreds of instances with bears in houses with people, and nobody killed. Um, we killed 20, or we killed 2,000 to 2,500 of them every year in our two states alone, Nevada and California. 2,000 to 2,500 a year. They've never killed one of us. Hunters kill by far the most. We have a large take in, uh, in California. We have a rather, rather small one here. Uh, road hits uh, take quite a few. And then uh, by far the biggest is the depredation and uh, the killing for bears being um, nuisances or possibly threats to public safety. Uh, if anybody was going to be dead by at the hands or the paws of a bear, um, I think it would be either me or some of my volunteers. We are with these bears all the time, on a daily basis. We chase them, um, we corner them in garages, we corner them in houses, we chase them um, out of uh, their dwellings when they hibernate under houses. This is something that happens all winter long. We go on calls constantly getting bears, and we have to crawl under there. We have to crawl under there and get them awake and slap them or you know, throw something at them and wake them up and get them out. Uh, you think that's dangerous? I've done it many, many times. We're also with mothers who comes all the time, uh, it, it just almost daily. We chase them with just our slingshots or our paintball guns. Uh, we don't carry any lethal weapons whatsoever. Uh, they run off from us. They're scared of us. I mean, we yell. You know, we don't wimp out and go, go on, bear, go on. We're, we're serious about it. But I'm not going to tell you we haven't been bluff charged. That's a whole other thing. We have been, and it's uh, extremely blustery. They come up right at you, and boom. Now, I've been bluff charged many times. I've never been attacked. It looks like they're going to. Uh, sometimes they stir up the dust around me. Uh, one of them even spit on me one time. He got so close. But in all the times I've been charged, bluff charged, by a bear, I've never been killed. Not even <laughs> once. <laughs> Why? Why is that? Because they're not dangerous. That is propaganda. That is nonsense. They are not. They are, they are submissive timid. This, this bear is up on that roof. We're coming close to get a picture. He's looking at us. As we get even closer, he drops his head down, which is a sign of extreme submission, and his nose is running because he's crying. He's afraid. He wants us to back away. When they, and this is what, this is what they instead do. They, they will run. They're not, they're not going to attack, and especially if you stand up to them and if you can understand them. You've got to be able to understand what they're saying. One, there was one woman I felt so sorry for. She had just bought a house on the North Shore, and she was all excited about moving into Tahoe, and all of a sudden she called me one day and she said, I have to sell my house unless you can help me. My neighbors just told me there's bears in Tahoe. And I said, yeah, you didn't know that? And she said, no, and I'm absolutely terrified. I can't live here unless you can help me. So we tried to talk to her. I talked to her. She called every day. I tried to take her on some calls with me. She had never seen one. But she was still just so terrified of it that she was ready to sell her house and, and leave the area, which I thought was a shame. She was a really nice lady. We like nice people here. So we went on and on like this, and she was actually ready to, to list it. And all of a sudden, one day, she called me, her daily phone call, and she said, Ann, i got to tell you what happened. I'm not selling my house. I'm staying. She said, i got to tell you what happened today. I was sitting out in my lawn. I got brave enough to go out and sit in my lawn. And I was on the check on the lock, chase lounge out back, and I had a book, but I was too scared to read it. But I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get into this. I can do this. <laughs> and she said, I kept thinking, oh, one's coming. I just know one's coming. And she's looking around, and she said, sure enough, I saw a bear coming down the path towards me. 
She said, I don't know if he knew I was there or not, but I was sure he was coming to kill me and eat me. And she said, I, I just sat there frozen in fear. I couldn't even move. And all of a sudden, from one side of the path, just about a foot in front of the bear, ran a little chipmunk. <laughs> and she saw this. And the bear leaped into the air, made a 180, and flew back the other way, scared to death of the chipmunk. So this woman no longer was fearful of bears. <laughs> but people are. People are, and that's what sabotages our ability to act appropriately when we meet a bear. This picture was taken by a woman who loved the bears, but she was afraid. But she put food out on her deck, and she actually was, you know, enjoying having them come up. Well, one day she had the slider open, and she was in the kitchen a little ways. And there was a bowl of pineapples on the on the counter, and the bear smelled that. Like Madonna said, they they can smell real. They can smell good. They don't smell good. <laughs> they can smell. Anyway, so he came and approached. She's walking up closer. <laughs> To, to get that pineapple, and she freaked out and instead of going, no, and stomping her feet and lifting up her arms and like, get out of here, she ran up the stairs and hid under the bed. Uh -huh. So, of course, the bear came in and uh, got all the pineapple and came back every day. But the problem that, that we see with that is that people are being told in many different ways and from many different sources that they need to be afraid of bears. That is destroying our ability to act and react appropriately when we meet a bear, when we encounter a bear, when a bear comes into our yard or onto our deck. If we're fearful, we are going to tell that bear, I'm submissive, I'm going to go hide in the closet, you can have the keys to the car, to the house, you can take everything out of the refrigerator, I'm out of here. We don't want to tell them that. We're losing the battle by telling them that. We have to stand up to them and tell them, no, I'm the dominant animal here. This is my property. You can't be here. Now get out. They will run off. There's two tricks that you have to remember. No food. This is real easy. If you take anything home tonight and be mean. <laughs> not out in the wilderness. That's different. We're not talking about that tonight. We're talking about bears in the community and problems with bears right underfoot of people. No food and be mean. But in order to do that, you have to understand these animals and you have to be able to treat them appropriately when they come around. It's not fair to lure them in either with your ignorance, your unwillingness to learn about them, or your love of them. By luring them, this bear got an apple from one resident every single day at noon. She thought it was cute. He came, got his apple, and she went on vacation after about two months of that. So he goes to the neighbor's house to get his apple, and he shot him. He's dead now. That woman killed him with kindness, killed him with love. That is not fair. Any more fair than it is to put your garbage out, or any more fair than it is to run and hide upstairs in the, in the bathroom while you hope that he goes away. It's all the same thing. This is a video that isn't going to play because I found out I didn't load it right. But what it is, it's a quick video clip that someone sent me. They're all excited. Uh, because they'd seen a bear, but they're doing everything wrong. In that you can hear, the, the bear wanders around on the deck for a while, and he looks in the window, and he comes right up, and the guy is standing there taping this, and he's going, shh, shh, there's a bear on the deck. Look how cool that is, there's a bear on the deck. And the bear's walking around and feeling right at home, and everybody's being real quiet in the house. Nobody's stomping their feet, nobody's banging on the window, nobody's telling him to leave. Okay, so he's going to come back again, or he's going to go to someone's else, someone else's house, and they're going to shoot him. Or they're going to call him a nuisance because he's up on a deck. He hasn't been told that he can't be there. He's been told, you're welcome here. So we have to remember that the bears have always been here. This is bear territory. They have always been here. Uh, for a while, they were a little more elusive, and they ran back into the forest, uh, and they hid out from us. Now they're getting braver, and they're coming around because it's <coughs> worth it. They're getting rewarded. But they're here. They're not going away. No state agency would ever kill them all. Yet they're assigned to protect them, to keep a healthy population of these animals. They are not, no matter how much you complain about it, or even if I changed my mind and said, I'm done with it, I can't deal with it anymore, I want them all gone. It's not going to happen. So they're here, and we're here, and we're in the same habitat together. So what we need to do is to try and understand how 
can we make this work whether we like them or we don't like them. We're here together and we need to try and understand how they work and so that we can finally be the smart ones, which we haven't been. I'm sorry, but we haven't. And it's time that we are so that we can finally coexist with these animals. One of the things that uh, we have to do is, is understand the fear level and where that puts us. There's a little child looking at a bear going under the deck. She has no fear yet. She's young. Um, and how long will it be before she reads things or watches scary movies or her big brother tells her there's a bear under her bed that's going to get her or she reads some propaganda about it uh, and, and she changes her mind and she's afraid. That bear did nothing to her. She's still alive today. I know her. He didn't attack her. Misconceptions, myths, and misunderstandings. These are things I want to clear up real quickly. Just a few. Uh, once a garbage bear, always a garbage bear. Not true. There's a study going on in California right now. Uh, a good friend of mine, Mario Cliff, has been, uh, he's not doing it this summer yet, but we've tagged uh, and collared several bears that we caught in dumpsters to see, do they live in dump Do they live in that garbage? I mean, is that how they make their living? No. Every one of them we've captured, and we have nine of them that have collars on right now, they've all gone so far back into the woods. They'll come back around once in a while, but they're gone for months back in the woods. So once a garbage bear, not always a garbage bear. He's still a viable bear in a part of the population. Also, uh, bears are dangerous man-eating monsters. Not true. These are depictions on hunter-based magazines. They're drawings. They're not real. Bears can't do that. They can't even make their face look like. You have to be trained to do that, and then they get a cookie if they do it, like Bart the Bear the movie star. Getting between a mom and cubs, getting anywhere near a mom and cubs means certain death. No. No black bear mother with cubs has ever killed a human being anywhere in North America at any time in history for being around her cubs. Bear, bears have killed people. Not out here in our three states, remember, but they have killed people, but never has it been a mother bear for someone getting near her cubs. Once a bear comes in a house, you're dead. No. Um, they, they come in and they wreck stuff, yes, but like I said, nobody's been killed, so that doesn't mean that the bear has to be destroyed. It means we need to lock up our houses. And Brian, uh, Ryan Welch is here tonight from uh, the Bear Busters, and he's a really good person to talk to about uh, possibly putting up some uh, electrical uh, bear protection devices on your home to keep this from happening. This doesn't need to happen. This is not a good thing. Um, but basically, one thing I want you to remember is that everywhere, all around Tahoe, right in your neighborhood, right out behind your backyard, so at some point and at some time, there is a bear that is hiding behind a tree or waiting beside the dumpster or hanging out, waiting for you to mess up and do something stupid so that he scores because that's exactly what's happening. They are waiting for you to do something silly. Let's not do that. <coughs> keep, keep them wild, keep them safe, and remember, if, if you uh, can come into my mind for just a minute and understand where, where we feel on this, so the never-ending onslaught of man's takeover of every square inch of livable space on this planet, there is no longer room for all the species to have their own spot. We have to share. Humans have to share with the other animals. It's either that or we have to take it from them. What's going to be left if we do that? It's going to be humans, rats, and cockroaches. That's the prediction. Unless we change our way of thinking and understand that we need to share and share with these beautiful animals and not kill them for being in what we call our space, if we can't do that, we're going to lose. And I don't want that to happen. So if you have any questions at the end, I'll be happy to um, address them. But thank you very much for your attention. And for having me. So um, basically, um, what it did does with, uh, with um, with our trash program is we do have the trash compliance number, which is 832-1221. If you don't call that number, we don't know what's happening. 
uh, we won't respond. And so it's very vital that if you are going to call on a trash complaint, please have an address and call 1221. After hours, the message that we leave is going to prompt you to call an outside contractor because uh, I, can't, I can't do trash 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But um, anyway, um, this is how our enforcement works. Um, for the first offense, and it is an ordinance violation. There is a difference between an ordinance violation and a wildlife violation. An ordinance violation is somebody who typically puts their trash out before it's the service date. Um, and it hasn't been broken into by wildlife yet, but it's out there, it's waiting to happen, and it will get you fined to $100 plus my labor, which is gonna be 85 bucks. <laughs> So that's what happens with the with the ordinance violation. If it happens again, it's 300 bucks, and we stay at that, and then we will end up forcing you to put in a wildlife resistant box. So that's pretty much how we go with that. We um, rarely give warnings. If there's trash out there, um, we're going to get you for it. Um, for the wildlife mines, there you can see they're a little bit stiffer. Um, if you choose to put your garbage out before your uh, service date or put it out in a bag or something that's not secured for wildlife, it's going to cost you 300 bucks on your first offense. And that's also in addition to an $85 labor fine. With that first offense, you are going to get a bear card. You're going to get a lockable bear card. There's one with outside. It, with that, yeah, you can check those out. Uh, you will get a bear card with your first offense. Um, the second offense, it, the second, second of subsequent offenses of the wildlife violation, you're going to find thousand uh, dollars. It's going to go up to a thousand plus my labor. Um, Don't keep going. Just in my plus my labor. So um, we uh, have given out a thousand dollar fines. Um, uh, they, uh, you know, it's it's it happens. There's people who just can't get it right. Um, so that is something to watch out for. It's, um, you know, we don't mess around with it, and there's a lot of people in the community who are very vigilant about calling it in. Um, you know, we seem to hear about from about the same, I don't know, 15 to 20 people all the time. So they're out there and they're watching. So um, it, it, it can hit the pocketbook pretty hard. Um, as far as the $1,000 fine goes, we really like to use that fine is for leverage um, because it's not all about money to get. It's not about filling our pockets with fines. We've given, I don't know, a very large percentage of the money back. Once the people can sell us something concrete that they're doing, that is going to keep them from not going down this path again. Um, so they happen. Um, again, trash hotline. If you can't, if you don't call that trash hotline, we don't know what's happening, and it'll continue to happen. Um, registered trash complaints, as you can see. Um, we started back in 2005. As you can see, the, they have dropped over the years. Um, we've only got 35 wildlife complaints so far. In, is that wildlife complaints? Or That's that total, all complaints. That's total complaints. And that might seem like a little bit not being you know, made not as much as you would think. We're seven months into it already. Um, this does work from January to January, so that is a that's the cycle that we're we're putting these numbers in. Um, anyway, 35 complaints so far. That's pretty good. Um, I know there's been more than that, but that just goes to show you that there's probably been twice that, but we haven't been called. So um, if you can call, we'll we'll take care of it. But as you can see, the numbers are starting to come down. People are starting to come around. So uh, we actually have people that call into Madonna and want to buy bear totes and uh, want to know where they can get a metal bear box. So <laughs> it's catching. Um, this is what I see most of the time. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a water operator by trade, certified. I don't pick up garbage, but uh, you know, uh, that's what they have me do during the day. That's what happens, but uh, it, it gets a little, it gets a little tiring after a while, as you can see. I'd rather be doing something else. Um, downstairs. I see this all the time. 
Um, it's right there in your face. There's a latch, there's a hasp, there's a staple. It takes two seconds to shut the dumpster and close it. it, it, it it's really pretty easy. Um, I see empty dumpsters with uh, garbage on top a lot of times. I see uh, bear proof containers at residences with that are empty and garbage is literally sitting outside. So that's that's what we're dealing with most of the time. If you find one of these dumpsters that is unable to be unlocked or does not have the hasp and staple and carabiner type lock, please call Ways Not and uh, they'll address that. Um, yeah, okay. The way our ordinance reads is that you can put your trash out and anything you want, uh, as long as it's after 5 a.m. on your service day. But service doesn't start till 7. So in that two hours, if you choose to put your trash outside something that's not secured, uh, you, you might get a visit from us or, or the contractor. Not a visit from us, but you get a letter. Uh, uh, all bear boxes have to be approved. Um, obviously, uh, wood bear boxes don't don't work. Uh, we, we have a lot of them in town. Uh, people think they work. They think it's a cheap alternative, uh, but it, it it's not going to get you anywhere. Um, we've seen where they crawl underneath houses, pull the heating ducts from the floor, and worked at that hole until they were able to get access. So that's not going to stop them. So 5 a.m. on the day of service, and just remember, if your can's not secured, you're taking the risk of getting a bear. So don't want to do that. Metal bear boxes work a lot better. Um, I've never seen any damage from a bear to one. That they're quite sturdy. Um, and you know, I, I, I think the price for one of these is, is, is a pretty good cost for, um, you know, uh, for what could what could happen, you know, it, it's 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 a it's a fair amount to pay to keep the bears safe. So, um, but we uh, waste not will assist you with that. If you look want to have a bear box put in, please call Rebecca at Waste Not at eight three two twelve eighty four, and she'll assist you in that. Um, yeah, uh, poly cards. <laughs> These are what's issued to you, the one over here on the top left, that's what's issued to you on your first wildlife offense. As you can see there, you know, if a bear works at this thing for a while, he's going to get in it. Um, it's, in my mind, it's, it's a band-aid, um, you know, but that's, that's, that's what we're doing until we can uh, convince everybody to put in a metal bear box. Uh, they, there's a number of places that sell them, as Madonna's put over here on the on the side of the slide. Um, it's something that's well worth checking out. Um, yeah, storing your trash, storing your trash in the in the garage is, is not a good idea. Uh, I've seen it time and time again. Um, you know. It, it, if you do that, you're going to be buying a new garage door or some new siding for your house. They'll get, they'll get in there. Um, I've personally seen some of these messes myself, and it, it's not pretty. So um, store your garbage somewhere that can be secured from wildlife. I mean, that's, that's as simple as we can get it. Um, get a box, because uh, this could happen to you. Um, and, and now uh, this is going to bring this back to Madonna. And uh, just remember, you guys, if you don't call the 1221 number with any kind of trash complaint that you may see, we, we can't respond to it. So um, please leave the name, or not a name, but an address, and uh, what you see there so that we can uh, take care of it as soon as possible. A lot of times getting to a trash complaint is difficult for us because we have other duties we're performing during the day, but we do try to make it our top priority when a trash call comes in to get out there as quick as we can. Um, so please call the number, call the contractors to adopt their hours, and uh, that's, that's the best help you can give us. Uh, thank you. Mr. Alcara, the Compliance Department and Waste Not work very closely together in public works. 
Um, so I just wanted to touch bases on the last couple of points here from it did. Um, my pet peeve, it's not on this slide, if you have a garage and you keep food or trash in your garage, how many times have you left the door open? Not on purpose. It's one of the things I'm seeing more and more commonly around here getting reports of a bear walking into a garage that was left open. So uh, please take Daryl's advice uh, seriously. $1,000 for a bear box to avoid a problem with a bear or damage to your property um, is a pretty good investment for your property. Um, the things we can do for you in Wasteland, if you want to buy a bear box and you don't know where to put it, you don't know, don't know who to call, we've got all that information for you. All our referral services are free. Um, if you um, want to find out about a bear cart, we've got those in WasteNet. There are also other vendors in the area and places that they're sold. We can help you with that. Um, if you want brochures, flyers, trash hotline cards, we have lots of those. If you want to uh, present, give those to uh, community groups you're with or have WasteNet come and do a presentation about bear awareness to your uh, community organization or your school or your neighborhood or your HOA, we're happy to come and do that. Um, Ryan from Bear Busters is here. Um, if you're having a problem with bear coming in, we've started uh, working with him a little bit on some electrifying of the property. Um, we had a bear living under a house in incline or a deck, and over the winter, the homeowner worked with the Bear League and with Ryan to um, put hot wire under the deck. So the bear never came back. So that's kind of some of the strategy that's going further. So we do have Ryan's information, and we have bear box vendor information and all that. So our number is 832-1284. Uh, and if you call us and you want to talk to compliance, we'll be happy to transfer you. Again, that trash hotline number, it's the only number you should call about a trash complaint. If you want a response from maybe get it's 832-1221. I'm back to Bear Smart. I think we can get there. I think we can get better here in our community. I know the community will is there. Uh, now it's a matter of us getting together and forming cooperative partnerships investing some money, some time, and some energy to make it happen. Um, call us an indicate if we can help you help the bears. It makes me have a good day when another bear box goes in and we've taken care of yet another location. We only have a couple hundred bear boxes and a couple hundred carts in town for this whole community, so we do have a long way to go to keep get those investments going. Um, what are we going to see if we get to be a bit more bear smart? We're going to see uh, an economic benefit for our wildlife viewing, for our recreation, we don't have, we have, we have a black eye nationally over bear issues. It's always running up and down the west coast whenever a bear has to be killed, um, when bears are breaking in. So we've got some PR uh, damage control to do for our community, but I think we could turn it around and there's enough will and enough drive and enough uh, energy to try to make us a leader in this community. I'd like to put us on that bear smart community list. Um, so with your help, uh, thank you for your attention.